So I first started diving um, back in 1990, so um, I'm a fully qualified British Aquaculture Club dive leader and I guess the, the really exciting thing for me is the, the time when you're actually underwater and um, being having that three-dimensional uh, um, ability to to go up or down or left or right or just float there it's just amazing and uh, obviously you're doing it weightless weightless and uh, it's just fantastic and highly recommend it to anybody okay so the idea the original idea to dive in the river weir here in Durham was one that came from my wife Angela I can recall it quite clearly. We were in we were in Durham. It was a Sunday afternoon, having a nice walk around the river. We ended up having a, a coffee uh, adjacent to the river, and Angela asked when I was going to go diving next. But she meant the Farne Islands. But because it was April, it was too early in the season. Um, she said, "Well, why don't you go diving there?" And she pointed down to the river, and she actually said, "You're sure to find something old." But I dismissed her idea there and then because the river was the same colour as the coffee we were drinking. But if a couple of weeks later conditions improved and I managed to convince my brother Trevor to join me on an exploratory dive to have a look in the river. You never know we might find something old. So when I very first went diving in the river we had no sort of expectations what we might find. I can recall standing on the bridge and looking through the river down to the riverbed it, it is quite shallow in, in places and you can see the the sand and the the, the 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 pebbles that are just on the riverbed so there's always a possibility that we might find something just lying there but never in a million years did we dream that i would go on to find so many so many thousand objects I guess I keep myself safe while diving in a number of different ways. First of all, I make sure that all my kit is serviced regularly. Um, I wear a dry suit, which keeps me warm. The dangers associated with drowning uh, isn't really an issue because if I ran out of air, I would simply stand up until it's only seven, seven foot deep. Um, so I'm quite safe that way. The dangers that you get in the sea, for example, nitrogen narcosis and the bends aren't a feature here in Durham because it's so shallow. And probably the biggest risk is being struck by a rowing boat or, or an oar from, from one of the vessels. And I, I mitigate that by getting there early in the morning, just as the sun comes up, and getting myself down, sort of hugging the, the riverbed out of the way of any, any, any chance of being struck. For me, the most uh, interesting story of all of the objects has to be associated with the Anne Stewart obituary ring. This beautiful, delicate little object, it's 22 karat gold. It has a rock crystal front with an ivory backing and inscribed around the ribbon are the words Anne Stewart Obit, October 1775, age 35. So this very poignant, small object, made even more so by the fact that filaments of Anne's hair survived trapped between the rock crystal and the ivory backing. And what an amazing story that is, just to, to discover that a lady called Anne Stewart died here in Durham City at the, at the young age of 35. For me, I guess the, the object in the exhibition that is the most wonderful is a very small pewter badge. It's a pilgrim badge. Um, it's circular in form and in the centre it depicts a mitred bust. It has this little cute little face that just jumps out at you. Similar objects of that type are associated with pilgrimage to the, to the shrine of St Thomas a Becket at Canterbury. But given that my object was found within 350 metres away from a major northern saint's shrine, the shrine of St Cuthbert, could this little face this mitred bust be that of St. Cuthbert. And if it is, that is absolutely incredible, really important because it is the only material, only, sorry, it is the only material culture evidence of pilgrimage to the shrine of St. Cuthbert that's actually being found. The Elizabeth and Walter brooch is a very special object. It's highly decorated, the detail is incredible. Elizabeth I standing there in her dress, she looks absolutely beautiful. 
it's just standing uh, alongside and looking lovingly at Sir Walter Raleigh, just a, a meter or so, just a few yards away. They're standing adjacent to a sort of a, a, a decorated balustrade, so this romantic setting. And I guess the incredible thing about that particular object is it's dated to the 18th, early 19th century. So not from the time of the Tudor period when Elizabeth I was, um, was queen. So it just tells us a little bit about how that story, that love story, has traveled through time, through the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries. And even today, people will think on, or think fondly of it. And here we have evidence that during the 18th and 19th century, people had exactly the same thoughts about it. The Georgian Intaglio seal matrix is a really unusual find. Actually, during the 18th century, it would have been a common object, worn typically uh, by a gentleman associated with his waistcoat, uh, with his pocket watch, would have been held in his waistcoat pocket. Um, so they were perhaps a common object to have. What's really unusual about the Durham example is the fact that it depicts a, a really unusual scene. It's um, a fawn or a, a satire copulating with a young woman or a nymph so really unusual not really sure what that's all about but nevertheless it's a really wonderful object dated from that 18th century the trade plate belonging to ellen coldclough Col is a really special object not only do we get her name we, we identify her as an ironmonger operating out of silver street the research has been able to pinpoint exactly what the location of that premises and we know that it's 38 Silver Street. Ellen Coldclough herself was born in 1854 and at the relatively young age of 26 she found herself uh, following the death of both her parents in charge of not just the shop but uh, responsible for her seven younger brothers and sisters and also a 15 year old housemaid called Elizabeth Baker. Elizabeth, sorry, Ellen, was clearly very successful. The shop itself expanded and incorporated number 40 Silver Street, uh, and it was subsequently handed down to uh, some uh, children who, look, who looked after it, um, and it became Durham's oldest surviving ironmonger. So she was clearly a successful lady, given the challenges that she had in life. Alec Newton medals to me are absolutely incredible. They have this amazing story associated with them. They're actually the uh, British War Medal and British Victory Medal presented to Second Lieutenant A.C. Newton, the Royal Horse Artillery, and, and he would have been the recipient of those medals in 1919. Through research, we've identified that the medals themselves were presented to William Alexander Cochrane Newton, um, the man himself has this amazing story. He was born into British aristocracy. His childhood friend was the Prince of Wales, who was Edward III, the man who, the king, who went on later to abdicate. Shortly after the war, Alec Newton married his childhood sweetheart, and they emigrated to Canada, and they never set foot back in England. They were su amazingly successful in, can in Canada, Eventually, after the, the King's abdication, um, Alec Newton managed, um, was asked to and managed the English Prince's Ranch in Calgary. So he did that uh, for quite, quite a while. His childhood friend was, uh, visited the, fran the, the ranch, ranch quite often and they had this great um, friendship. So the great mystery is how did those two medals end up back in England when Alex himself never set, never left Canada. His two children, uh, one of which was Douglas, who um, served with the Canadian Navy during the Second World War on a minesweeper, he never returned to England either. And the, the common denominator for me, given that Alex Newton's medals were found in a section of the riverbed where we were recovering the Bishop Ramsey gold and silver medallions in exactly the same spot, is that Bishop Ramsey himself, during the 1920s, traveled to Canada. He went from the Pacific coast to the Atlantic and he stopped in every diocese. And did he, by any chance,
actually visit the English prince's ranch during that time. And if he did, that would be the connection. Did his son, Douglas, ask Bishop Ramsey himself to take the medals back to England to deposit them, perhaps, in the river? And that's not an unusual request to do because it was common practice during that second world, sorry, the following the First World War, for soldiers to either bury them, bury the medals in the ground or to literally throw them in the river. And it was a way of getting rid of the horror, horrific memories that they would have had. So is there a link there? You know, there's so much more research still to be done and I can't wait to find out. Ultimately, those medals should be on display in the, the museum in the, the, at Woolwich, in the, Royal, in the Royal Artillery Museum. Get them on, get them on display and that will be a wonderful end to, to their story. The dentures that I found are um, in many ways quite horrific when you first look at them, but you've got to imagine that a quaint old lady would have worn those, ob those objects. And they would have been her big bright smile. They, we can date them to 1880 to 1920. They were originally made, of, oh, they are made of vulcanite with uh, enamel teeth in there. They look quite ghastly when they were first found because they were dirty, but they did clean up quite well. Um, and you've just got to imagine that Given that the, the relatively small shape of the palette, they would have been worn by a petite old lady who perhaps, while crossing over Elver Bridge, just paused to look over, and either because of a sneeze or a cough, or just, just by opening her mouth to say something, she lost her valuable possessions into the river. And you just imagine how quickly she made herself um, get back home at the end of that day. There's, there's several reasons why the objects themselves have ended up in the river. You've got accidental loss, objects that would have perhaps fallen from Elbert Bridge. We know that the bridge itself is 12th century. It was a major route, the centre, um, a major thoroughfare up onto the peninsula. And booths and bothies and shops and temporary structures were built on the bridge, many of which overhung the bridge. And they were locations where stock could have been uh, locked away on the night time and vendors and peddlers, men, who would have, men and women who would have come out in the morning just to open up their little stall on their bridge to sell their wares to the passing trade. And that accidental loss of things like buckles and buttons, objects that would have been offered up for sale, it seems to be a really good reason why many of the objects have ended up in the water. Um, another reason is the fact that the tenements that abutted the river, the tenements uh, on either side in the borough of New Elvis, and also on the um, clear path side, Saddle Street side, sorry. Um, there would have been workshops down there, so as the tools were, were damaged or worn or broken, the casting material, the, the detritus from the, the, uh, and the night soil from the tenements itself were literally just thrown into the river as a rubbish bin, so it was just a collector of rubbish. And I guess the, um, given that the River Weir seasonally floods quite extensively, you can just imagine those early tenements that were really up against the river. The contents of their buildings would have been washed into the river just by the, you know, the magnitude of the flood water. But I guess probably the most um, interesting reason why many of the objects have ended up in the river is associated with pilgrimage. So we know that from other riverine sites around the UK, similar collections of pilgrim badges and, and secular badges have been discovered in water, uh, the water context, and Durham is just another example of that. So during that late medieval period, if you were a pilgrim on, on a grand tour of, a, of a, a series of shrines, and you came to somewhere like Durham to visit the shrine of St. Cuthbert, you would want to buy the t-shirt you know, the evidence that you've been to Cuthbert Shrine. But during the medieval period, those objects took the forms of pilgrims' ampulla or, pil or badges. And the iconography on, imparted on the badges would display, uh, would, would be iconog iconography associated with the saint. And for superstitious reasons, and this is just a theory, but we believe that pilgrims would buy two badges. They would wear one, perhaps on, on their head, headdress or on their clothing um, but they would deliberately throw the second object, second badge into a river 
for purely a superstitious reason as a thank offering for a safe journey home.